this is basically a lecture on support vector machines though you would see on the screen the title statistical learning theory. Let me tell you a bit of history. <coughs> uh, there were two statisticians named Vapnik and Charvonenkis. They are uh, they are the main persons who created this subject statistical learning theory. Um, they are they are statisticians from Russia. You know there was a cold war period between America and Russia and these people have done their work basically during the cold war period and uh, after the cold war was over after then um, when there were communications between Russia and America they became normal. These people they went to United States and they presented the statistical learning theory in a conference in computer science. In a computer science conference they presented this one. The basic problem that they attempted to solve here is when you design a classifier you have a training set using the training set you design the classifier then using the test set somehow you measure its performance and then if the performance on the test set is also satisfactory then you say that fine everything is fine with the classifier but is it really fine with the classifier even if it does well on the test set how do you say that your classifier is generalizable the performance of the classifier that you have somehow got how do you say that it has generalization capability is there any mathematical way of expressing it and if you express it mathematically is there any way of obtaining it and if you also obtain it then uh, for the different classifiers that we are using is there any way in which you can calculate the generalizability of these classifiers. So, this is the basic question that they attempted to solve they had, since they are statisticians and they attempted to solve the whole thing using statistical language. So, they coined the term statistical learning theory and support vector machines which probably you have heard from many people it is sort of a byproduct of statistical learning theory sort of a byproduct of statistical learning theory this is the basic history and uh, you will find a book by Vapnik on statistical learning theory which is basically a book on statistics and uh, you will find support vector machines being considered a part of neural networks you will find them to be considered a part of machine learning and data mining and of course, since we are talking about classifiers and their performance you will consider them to be a part of pattern recognition. So, you will find support vector machines almost in all these fields you will find support vector machines in all these fields and the generalization of support vector machines like kernel machines etcetera. So, this is sort of the basic little bit of history. Now, let me try to explain the basic terminology. Uh, you look at your screens, the first one is you are given um, points in capital N dimensional space. Okay. You are given small n points x 1, x 2, x n you see the very first step you are given small n points x 1, x 2, x n they are in capital N dimensional space theta i denotes the label of the class label of the point x i. I am assuming that you have two classes only and the class labels are given as minus 1 and 1 and uh, p x theta 
small p x theta, this is the probability distribution on the data. That means, there is some probability distribution, this is the small p is the density function and capital P that is the actual uh, capital P of A is equal to integral of small p integral over A of small p. Small p is the density function and capital P is the actual probability. Now, these points are x 1, x 2, x n and the corresponding theta is they are assuming they are assumed to come from the distribution p x theta, where p x theta is not known and here it is written they are IID independent and identically distributed. Now, in classification what exactly is the problem? The problem is you are given n points small n points and you have the corresponding class labels somehow you need to find the function from x i to theta i. Are you understanding it? Somehow you need to find the function, if you find the functional form which for every x i if it gives you, if you find you find the functional form where for every x i the function gives the value theta i then you are done you need to find the corresponding functional form that is the basic problem of classification. These f you can call them as um, you can have many names for it okay. and uh, some f when for, for one class it will give you plus 1 another class they are going to give you minus 1 and at some place they will get the value 0. If when the value is 0, then you call it as the separation between the class 1 and class minus 1, right. When the value is given as 0, then you call it as separation between the class plus 1 and between the class plus 1 and minus 1. Now, what is it that we are given? We are given a set of functions script f that is the functions are small f x s are the input alpha, alpha is the parameter set um, alpha bar it is written it is in the vector form. So, all these alphas are adjustable parameters and f is a function actually let me just try to explain it to you. Um, I hope all of you know what multilayer perceptron is you have an input layer and you have some hidden layers, you have an output layer. When you are going from input layer to hidden layer, you have several connections and you have connection weights. You start with some initial connection weights okay. from input layer to hidden layer 1, hidden layer 1 if you assume 2 hidden layers and hidden layer 1 to hidden layer 2, then hidden layer 2 to output layer at between every 2 such layers you have many connections and you have connection weights. Put all the connection weights together and write it as a vector form, that vector you take it as alpha, that vector you take it as alpha okay. and x s are your inputs. Okay. Given an x and given an, given an x, given an x and given an alpha and uh, you have the usual neural network which is feed forward neural network, it will give you an output, the output is this f. Okay. Given the set of in given the where is given the set of input x 1, x 2, x n input vectors given alpha the adjustable parameters, then if you apply your neural network methodology the output is f. Okay. These are the adjustable parameters and f is a function. Now, if you change these alphas, if you change these alphas, the corresponding f is going to, I mean the values are going to be changed. If you change your network architecture, then f is itself is going to be changed. 
So, for a given input x and choice of alpha, f of x alpha will always give the same output. If you have a function f and if you have specified your alpha, f of x alpha will always give the same output. A particular choice of alpha generates a train machine. Why this particular choice? When you are training a neural network, you start with some, some choice and you go on changing it till by the end of your, I mean you have given some rule for termination and when it terminates, you assume that you have got a nice, I mean values for alpha. So, you are training the machine to get nice value for this alpha. A neural network with a fixed architecture with alpha corresponding to the weights and biases is a learning machine. Now, when you have a function f, when you fix alpha, what is the exact risk that you are taking? The risk is, it is observed is f of x alpha, expected is the actual one is theta, take the difference, take the difference modulus and d p x theta do the integration over all these axes that will give you sort of error or risk. What is it that we are calculating? What we are calculating is theta i for the ith point for an alpha, theta i is the targeted output, f of x i alpha is your observed output, the difference i is equal to 1 to n and 1 by 2 n this is empirical risk. This is what actually we are calculating. What we are supposed to calculate is this. Here I need to tell you one thing, I need to tell you one thing. All these things are explained here using the sign modulus and the similar results actually you will get when you take the square terms. When you take the square terms, which in neural network when you try to minimize the error, you take the square terms and then you take the double summation, you use some gradient descent and then you do the try to do the minimization, okay, there you take the square term for the error. Okay. Anyway, the results are similar. Okay. So, here everything is explained using the sign modulus. This is one thing that I am telling you, there is another one you will get them all this material from a famous um, lecture notes or I do not want to call it lecture notes, it is um, tutorial, it is written by Christopher Burgess, it is available on internet, okay. a tutorial on support vector machines. Whatever I am going to tell you about the support vector machines most of it you will find, you will get from that particular tutorial. Okay. <clears throat> now, so this is the risk that we are calculating and the actual risk that we are supposed to calculate is R f alpha. Now, choose eta so that 0 less than or equal to eta less than or equal to 1 here I am sorry this less than or equal to sign should not be there, it should be strictly less than 1. Okay. In fact, I would prefer that the other less other equality also should not be there, 0 strictly less than eta strictly less than 1, this equality signs should not be there. Okay. Then what was proved by Vapnik? was the actual risk that we are supposed to calculate, it is less than or equal to the empirical risk plus square root, there is an h here log 2 n, n is the number of points divided by h plus 1 minus log eta by 4 by n 
with probability 1 minus theta. That means, this relationship holds with probability 1 minus theta. This was what was shown by Wapnick. This was I think in the year 1983, 84 or is it 93, 94? I am not exactly sure. 83, 84 or 93, 94, this thing was shown. Okay. Now, if you look at this expression, note that in neural networks, we are trying to minimize this empirical risk. We are trying to minimize this empirical risk. But what we are supposed to be doing is, we are supposed to be minimizing the actual risk. Okay. Actual risk if we minimize it, actual risk if we minimize it, then uh, that is the thing that we want to do it. But by minimizing the empirical risk, are we actually able to minimize the actual risk? The problem is that after minimizing the empirical risk, still this much term is there. still this much term is there and uh, the actual risk is less than or equal to this plus this. This relationship is holding with probability 1 minus theta. Now, if we want this relationship to hold, then probably we need to take the value of eta to be very, very small. Suppose, we take it to be 0 0.05, then R f alpha less than or equal to empirical risk plus this that will happen with probability 0.95. So, usually people take the value of eta to be either 0 0.05 or some 0 0.01 some very very small value. Now, there is an unknown term here that term is h n is the number of points, eta is this parameter 0.05 or I mean point yeah point 0.05 or point 0.01, n is the number of points and there is this h. What is this h? h is a non-negative integer, this is called v c dimension, Wapnick v c for Wapnick Chervonin case. Okay. This is a non negative integer, h is called v c dimension, it has to be always an integer, it cannot take fractional values. This h provides what is known as capacity. We will come to what this h is slightly later. Eta is a small value, say 0 0.05. Now, let us denote this term, this one square root of h log 2 n by h, this whole term. Let us denote it by xi. Okay. This xi is independent of the distribution p. So, in this one, in this xi, eta is a constant that we have already fixed, n is the number of points. So, the only term is h, this h is a non negative integer, in fact, h is independent of distribution. What is this v c dimension? We will define define it slightly later. Okay. This is something independent of, this is independent of the distribution of the points. So, the whole xi is independent of the distribution p, xi is called v c confidence. Now, if we know h, we can compute xi. Now, learning machine is another name for a family of functions. We take that the machine which minimizes the right hand side of 1, this is the right, we actually we minimize this, this is something independent of that, independent of the uh, independent of the distribution and we minimize this and by minimizing this we hope that R f alpha and empirical alpha they are somehow very close. Now, let us see what the V c dimension is. V c dimension it is actually a nice quantity 
x i theta i they are the given points they belong to x i they belong to R n and you have n number of points theta i they take values minus 1 or plus 1 and these are the family of functions under consideration. Now, if you have small n points in how many different ways you can label them 2 power n different ways do you agree to that. If you have small n points you can label them in 2 power n different ways that is all the points you put it in class 1 that is one way. One point you put it in class 1 the rest n my, uh, sorry one point you put it in class minus 1 rest n minus 1 you put it in uh, one point yeah, all the points you put it in class 1 that is one way n minus 1 points you put it in class 1 one point you put it in class 2 then n minus 2 points you put it in class 1 one point you put it in class 2. So, if you do like this you have 2 power n different ways in which you can label n points. Now, a set of functions tau is set to shatter n points a collection of n points. If for every labeling of these n points we can get a function f which provides that labeling is this clear to you. Let me try to explain you you have you have a set of functions you have a set of n points this set of n points can be labeled in 2 power n ways for every labeling you need to get a function note that when I started this lecture I asked you what is our aim from the set of points you need to get a function 2 theta i the corresponding labels once we get a function then we are through our aim is just to get that function. Okay. Now, you have got 2 power n different labelings possible okay. for each labeling if you have a function which gives that labeling then we say that this set of functions is set to shatter n points. I will explain it to you slightly more de in a more detail after a few minutes. Now, V c dimension for a set of functions is defined as the maximum number of points that can be shattered by this. V c dimension is the maximum number of points that can be shattered by it. Suppose, the maximum number of points is 10 that means, a set of 10 points if it is shattered by the collection of functions and no set of 11 points, 11 points or 12 points or 13 points or 14 points, no set of 11 points or 12 points or 13 points or 14 points can be shattered by the set of functions. Then the V c dimension then the V c dimension of the set of functions is that value 10. V c dimension for a set of functions is defined as is defined as the maximum number of points that can be shattered by tau. V c dimension is h implies there exists one set of h points that can be shattered by tau, but it does not mean that every set of h points can be shattered by it. It does not mean that every set of h points can be shattered by it. I will explain all these things by using an example now. I can do the example on the board. I will do the example on the board. Um, okay, I can do it on the board. Suppose, you take set of straight lines. Suppose, you take set of straight lines and you take two points your function tau your set tau is all possible straight lines all possible straight lines okay and let us say we are in two dimensional space 
let us say we are in two dimensional space. Now, you take two points, how many labelings are possible? You have four labelings. Okay. Now, you take one straight line here and uh, this arrow denotes they are the given the sign positive sign. That means, all these both the points they are in the class plus 1. This is the straight line that is giving you this. Now, the second one for the same two points, this is another straight line that is putting this point in class 1, this point in class minus 1. For the same two points, we have a straight line which puts this point in class 1, this point in class minus 1 and you have the fourth one. Both the points are in class minus 1 and this side is class plus 1. Is this clear? So, two points they can be shattered by the set of straight lines. I have taken these two points like this, I could have taken them like this, I could have taken these two points in this way, I could have taken these two points in this way, I could have taken these two points in this way. In any way I take, okay, every set of two points it can be shattered by set of straight lines, am I correct? every set of two points. Now, what I will do is that instead of two I will take three. I will take three. This is one, two, three, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Here first I will put all of them in class 1, so, all the 3 of them in class 1, then I will start putting 2 points. These 2 points are in class 1, these 2 points are in class 1 and then these two points are in class 1. Okay. Now, I will put one point in class 1, this is in class 1, this is in class 1, this is in class 1. Then I will put no point in class 1 for this one, no point in class 1. So, here I have taken a set of three points, this is one set of three points, this is shattered by all the lines, this is shattered by the set of possible lines. Is this clear? Now, let us see whether every set of three points can be shattered, the answer is no, the answer is no you take three points on a single line. Let us say this point goes to minus 1, these two points are plus 1. Can you get a single straight line which gives you this result? No. Okay. So, now, here you have a set of three points that can be shattered by straight lines. Now, you take any set of four points, take any set of four points, no set of four points can be shattered by straight lines, no set of four points can be shattered by straight lines. 
you have this famous example. You remember this example? Now, you are seeing the connection between this one and neural networks. Many persons when they introduce support vector machines, they I mean they, when they introduce this one, they first tell this example and then they go to all these shatterings and other things. Uh, in fact, this can be proved mathematically that no set of four points can be shattered by straight lines. So, in R 2, for the set of straight lines, the V c dimension for the set of straight lines is 3. Let me repeat, in R 2, the V c dimension for the set of straight lines is 3, because there exists a set of 3 points that can be shattered by the set of straight lines, a set of 3 points okay, and no set of 4 points or anything more than 4 can be shattered by set of straight lines. Okay. So, V c dimension for the set of straight lines is 3. <coughs> this is the one. So, in two dimension tau consists of all straight lines, this is the example. V c dimension of straight lines is greater than or equal to 3 then note that V c dimension of straight lines is not 4, because no set of 4 points can be shattered by this one. So, V c dimension is 3. Now, it can be proved that V c dimension of hyperplanes in R n is n plus 1, <coughs> V c dimension of hyperplanes in R n is n plus 1. That means, if you are looking at R n and if you are looking at all possible hyperplanes, then you will be able to get a set of n plus 1 points, which can be shattered by these hyperplanes and no set of n plus 2 or n plus 3 or n plus 4 points can be shattered by it. <coughs> why, why this shattering is important? The shattering is important because note that in MLP we assume an architecture. Okay. We assume an architecture and then we make it learn. Now, the moment you assume an architecture, you have assumed certain functional form, right. You have assumed certain functional form. Now, with that functional form by varying all those alphas. If the given set of x 1, x 2, x n, if the given set of points, if you are not able to forget about given set of points, if you can, if you are in a position to sh shatter at least a set of n points, then probably we can think about getting the classification properly for the given set of n points. Let me repeat, if the with the function under consideration, if you are able to shatter at least a set of n points, say you are given smaller number of points, then we can think of whether we can shatter the given set of n points. The given set of n points, it has two classes some labeling is there and you are assuming a functional form by assuming an architecture. You are assuming a functional form by assuming an architecture, you are assuming a functional form. Whether this functional form, whether it at all can it shatter at least a set of n points. If it is not able to shatter it, whatever you do, I mean it is not going to, I mean if the V c dimension is less than that, then you have a problem. Are you understanding me? If the V c dimension is less than the value is small n, 
then you do have a problem. <coughs> now, there are some comments. It is not necessarily true that learning machines with more parameters will have a high V c dimension and learning machines with less parameters will have low V c dimension. Examples exist in literature. Now, the second one is that a family of classifiers will have infinite V c dimension, if they can shatter a set of n points, however large n may be. Okay. Now, examples exist in literature, where a set of functions has infinite V c dimension but they are not able to shatter a set of four points. Here I wrote set of finitely points, finitely many points. The example that was given there was for four points. It has infinite V c dimension, but on the other hand a finite point set having just four points, it is not able to shatter. Why? The problem is that, if you have a set of n points that can be shattered by the given function set, then the V c dimension is at least equal to that value small n, a set of n points. We are not saying that every set of n points is to be shattered. So, V c dimension by the very definition, it is a very weak one. I hope you are understanding this. It is very weak, because you are satisfied if it shatters a set of n points. One set of n points, if it shatters, you are satisfied. But then, our given point set, that also has n points, but then one set it can shatter, but this may, it may not be able to shatter. Then, you have a difficulty here. right? then you have a difficulty here. This is one of the problems that is actually, I mean because V c dimension as per definition, it is a very weak one. Yes, if V c dimension is 10, means at least one set of 10 points it can shatter. So, if it is something 11, 12 or 13, you know that you, uh, you probably may not get the what is that you may not get the classification that is there, but V c dimension 10 means 8, 9, 8, 7, 6 whether you can get the classification of this 8, 7, 6 points that is not clear. Something more you know that you cannot get it, but something less than that you do not have an idea that is the basic difficulty with V c dimension that is the place where theory needs to be developed. It should be something more strong than that, that a set of points can be shattered. Um, this I do not want to delve into these things. Theory connecting SVMs to structural risk minimization principle is not dealt here. So, I do not want to deal with these things. These are extremely, extremely highly mathematical subjects. These are highly mathematical subjects, and I do not want to go into all that mathematics at least now. Now, maximum margin classifier. So, I do not want to go into the connections between the V c dimension theory and S V M s. I am directly coming to S V M s. So, you have x i theta i s, i is equal to 1 to n, theta i belongs to minus 1 to plus 1, x i s r in r n. Now, I am assuming that data is linearly separable. That means, there exists a hyperplane, which gives you on one side of the hyperplane, you will get the positive points plus 1 points and on the another side of the hyperplane, you will get negative points that is minus 1 points. 
Now, there is a basic theorem here. If the given data set is linearly separable, the given data set is linearly separable if and only if the convex hulls of those things do not intersect. I hope you know this result. Okay. I will repeat it. The data is linearly separable, that means the plus one point set and the minus one point set, they are linearly separable, that, that there exists a hyperplane where on the positive side of the hyperplane you get all the plus one points, on the negative side of hyperplane you get all the minus one points. This is possible if and only if you take all the positive points, can construct its convex hull, take all the negative points, construct its convex hull, then these convex hulls they do not intersect. This is if and only if, that is if the convex hulls do not intersect, then you get a hyperplane and if you get a hyperplane, then the convex hulls do not intersect. Okay. Both these things are satisfied. So, data is linearly separable. So, there exists a hyperplane W. Okay. So, W prime x i greater than 0 for all i for which theta is equal to 1 less than 0 for all i for which theta is equal to minus 1 or you multiply by theta i, then theta i times this is w prime x i is greater than 0 for all i. For when theta i is equal to 1, 1 times w prime x i that is greater than 0, when it is minus 1, minus 1 times this, this is also going to become greater than 0. So, if there exists one such vector w for which this is greater than 0, this place this i and this i they should be replaced by prime transpose. Then there are infinitely many such vectors. How does one choose one optimal classifier? I hope this is known to all of you. If you have one hyperplane, then you are going to have infinitely many hyperplanes. You are going to have infinitely many hyperplanes. Um, if you look at the basic, uh, the hard limiting, simple perceptron, okay, simple perceptron, then in the convergence theorem, in the simple perceptron you assume the linear separability of the classes and you assume a hyperplane and you go on changing it till you go on changing it and then you can prove that as the number of iterations increases, the error actually I mean it goes to actually 0 that can be shown mathematically that is called perceptron convergence theorem. And uh, so, and uh, you have too many hyperplanes, it will go to one of the hyperplanes. Now, here the question is how does one choose an optimal classifier? Optimal from the point of view of what? Now, if there exists w such that theta i into w prime x i is greater than 0 for all i, then you take any delta, multiply by any delta, then delta w also satisfies this condition. Okay. Then what we can do is that, what we can do is that, we shall set the margin that is minimum distance of hyperplane to the positive point, same as minimum distance hyperplane to the negative point, that is positive points and negative points, we shall set the margin as 1 and achieve it with minimal weight. Now, let us see the meaning of that, <coughs> let us see the meaning of that. Now, you please look at it, here you have two classes in this class 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 points, in this class 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 points, 2 classes. Now, so this is one hyperplane, with respect to this plane, this hyperplane, you take the distance of this hyperplane with every one of the points, find out the one that has the minimal distance, 
the minimal distance is this. Again with respect to this hyperplane, find out the distance of this hyperplane with every one of the points, find out the one that has the minimal distance, the minimum distance is this. Okay. Now, you can choose this hyperplane in such a way that this is this shift is 1 and this shift is 1. Okay. This shift is 1 and this shift is 1, so that this totally it becomes 2 and the distance is actually 2 by norm of the weight vector, norm of the vector. It is 2 by norm of the vector. Now, basically if you take this, this distance is some value, but then you look at this hyperplane, this hyperplane when you take the distance of this hyperplane with every one of these points, the one that has the minimum distance is this and for this hyperplane again you do the same thing here, the one that has the minimum distance is this. Now, this is more than this, this distance is more than this. So, basically what we would like to do is that, we would like to choose a hyperplane in such a way that for that hyperplane with the same shift that you get a negative point and the same shift then you should get this positive point. So, that then basically you are going the distance between these two is 2 by actually norm of f norm of w where w is the w gives you the equation for this hyperplane that w prime x okay w gives you the equation for this hyperplane similarly in this case also w gives the equation for this hyperplane now, you are what we would like to do is we would like to maximize this or another way of putting it is norm of w is same as w prime w and you take the square root then you will get the norm. So, you like to maximize this because you want to take the distance to be same a distance to be the maximum its maximization of this is same as minimization of this. You want to maximize the margin, maximize the distance between this and this. The distance between this and this is taken as the margin and this classifier there is another name for it that name is maximum margin classifier. The word margin is used as the distance between this hyperplane and this hyperplane, the distance between this hyperplane and this hyperplane here. If you take the distance between this and this hyperplane, this will give you some margin here and this will give you another margin. This margin it is maximum of all the possible margins that we can have. So, this is maximum margin classifier. So, a way of saying it is you get the margin you maximize it or you minimize this or you minimize this. If you write a half here it does not matter because half is a constant you minimize this or you maximize this. So, minimization of half of w prime w where theta prime theta i into w prime x i is greater than 1 for all i is equal to 1 to n. Now, this is a what is known as q p problem quadratic programming problem. <coughs> Many results in fact, there is quite a bit of literature on convex optimization. There is quite a bit of literature on convex optimization. 
uh, the functions under consideration here they are all they are mostly convex functions in fact w prime w that is a convex function. Do you know the meaning of a convex function? A function is said to be convex, a function is said to be convex. A function is said to be convex, f is said to be convex. if for every x and y these are vectors f of lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y is less than or equal to lambda times f of x plus 1 minus lambda times f of y. Um, as an example, you please look at this. Please look at this. Say this is your x, this point is x, say this point is y, okay, and this is your function. Now, lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y is a point here lambda x plus 1 minus lambda into y, this is a point in between. Now, this is f of x, this is f of y, right. Lambda times f x plus 1 minus lambda into f y, this is if you vary lambda over all 0 to 1, this is for all lambda belonging to 0 to 1. If you vary lambda in the interval 0 to 1, then you will basically get this line segment. Now, you consider every value of the function in this interval, that value is less than the corresponding value here. So, this is convex. Is this clear? You take any value of the function here, and this is less than this value lambda f x plus 1 minus lambda into f y. So, this is a convex function. <coughs> there is quite a bit of literature on convex optimization um, and this quadratic programming problem of how to get this w's that is basically solved by using many results that are available in convex optimization, many results that are available in convex optimization. As you can see the main problem here is a quadratic programming problem. I hope all of you know what linear programming means. Linear programming means you have constraints linear and the function that is to be optimized that is also linear. Then the problem is called linear programming problem. In quadratic programming problem, the function to be optimized that is quadratic. As you can see w prime w that is quadratic, uh, that is why actually it is called quadratic programming problem q p problem. And, uh, so, we have assumed that the data is not is linearly separable. Now, if it is not linearly separable, then what people would do is theta i times w prime x i is greater than or equal to some 1 minus gamma or you can take this gamma to be dependent on i, you can take this gamma to be dependent on i that also you can have it, either you can have something fixed, but usually if you look at the literature, you have this thing gamma as dependent on i, 1 minus gamma i. 
So, minimum of again w prime w subject to these constraints. Now, this is going to be an extremely I mean in fact, it is an extremely complicated problem to solve. Um, and uh, this is when the classes are not linearly separable, then we make what is known as a soft formulation of the problem. Now, though it is quadratic programming problem that is true, but then when people try to solve this thing, quadratic programming is coming slightly later. Okay. And, uh, you see the optimization function that is under consideration is half of w prime w minus summation a i theta i times w prime x i minus 1, where these a i s are the Lagrange multipliers, use Lagrange multiplier. The basic problem is quadratic programming problem, because the constraints that the function to be maximized is quadratic that is half of w prime w. Now, you, when you want to solve it, one of the ways of that you do it is by using Lagrange multiplier, these a i s are Lagrange multipliers. Now, you do differentiation partial differentiation. So, you get you get this as 1. So, you take this thing to be equal to 0 that gives your w as this. Now, with a dual formulation the minimization can be achieved that is true, but uh, it is quite intensive in programming. Minimization can be achieved which is true but then the programming part of that thing is not actually a simple one, is not actually a simple one. Um, so, when this is generalized, this is generalized to a case where the data sets the two class problem is not linearly separable, which we had discussed in the previous slide then you take 1 minus gamma or 1 minus gamma i. The second one is that suppose you have more than two classes, suppose you have 3, 4, 5 classes, <coughs> then the problem becomes more complicated. There are two ways in which people have tried to solve it, one is one against the rest, it belongs to class 1 and not belonging to class 1 belongs to class 2 and not belonging to class 2, class 3 and not belonging to class 3. So, one against the rest that is one way and the second way is you take every pair 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5 and for each pair you try to get the linear boundary or the soft boundary. For each pair you try to get either the linear one or the soft one. Now, the problem formulation in all these cases it becomes uh, the solution of the problem becomes extremely complicated, extremely complicated and uh, this has given rise to another class of problems which are known as support vector regression problems. You see in this one this is the actual decision boundary, this is the one that is giving you the maximum margin. Now, this decision and this one it is passing through this point which is a data point, this one it is passing through this data point. What is the support vector? In fact, these two points are actually known as support vectors these two points are actually known as support vectors, because this is the actual decision boundary and then if you give minus 1 it is coming here, if you give plus 1 this is coming here and the plus 1 line is passing through this one, the minus 1 line is passing through this. Now, these are known as support vectors. Now, what is the usual regression problem? The usual regression problem is, I will do it here. The usual regression problem is
you have a data set suppose you are looking at linear regression then you are you would like to approximate this data set by a line like this now you have a line draw two parallel lines with the same distance in such a way that on this side there are no points and on this side there are no points all the points are lying in between these two lines. Now, getting hold of this line amounts to getting hold of these three lines and which amounts to the problem of support vector machines, where in support vector machine that prob problem formulation the points are lying either on this side of the line or on this side of the line two classes, here all the points are lying in between. Are you understanding me? It is basically the complementary one. Here all the points are lying in between. So, when you have all the points lying in between when you get this line, this is basically your regression line, which best approximates this. So, it gives it has given rise to what is known as support vector regression and regression has too many applications. Any forecasting problem is basically a regression problem or let me say most of the forecasting problems are regression problems. For the past 20 days the, the price of this stock is so and so, tomorrow what is the price. So, what line approximates this, what curve approximates this is regression. So, um, and regression has too many applications, even classification has too many application, regression has too many application and quite many people are working on support vector regression. There is one another comment that I would like to say, I have been talking about linear boundary, when linear boundary is non existing then what I am seeing is that I have put a margin there soft margin. Now, there is an extension of this one to non linear boundaries, where people actually consider kernels, people consider quadratic kernels or some other kernels for getting for obtaining boundaries, non-linear boundaries. You will find several topics or several subjects named say one subject is kernel machines. You might have found a book titled kernel machines. It is basically extension of SVMs to uh, non-linear when you have non-linear boundary then you basically use kernels to obtain the to at least try to obtain the non-linear boundaries. So, this is another extension from support vector machines. One is linear, but not exactly error 0 and another that is soft margin, another one is non-linear where you consider kernels and another one is support vector regression. So, lot of work is going on in all these fields and the work on these fields nowadays is termed as machine learning. So, with this I stop the lecture. <coughs>